Paris, France. The city of love evokes romantic images of the Eiffel Tower, the Notre Dame Cathedral, and the Louvre. But below the charming bistros, deep beneath the enchanting streets, the city of Paris holds a dark secret, the largest mass grave on earth, spanning over 300 kilometers. An echo of the past, there remains the eternal resting place of over six million people. Welcome to the Paris Catacombs. In the late 1990s, documentarian Francis Friedland discovered chilling footage on a video camera found inside the Paris Catacombs, years after the footage was shot. It's very bizarre. These arrows point in a direction. Occasionally also, he stops to photograph roomfuls of bones, which means that he's very, very deep inside the catacombs. The black and white footage was filmed by an unidentified man and remains an unsolved mystery to this day. As the video progresses, the man slowly develops a sense of fear and panic, eventually running through the dark tunnels before dropping the camera, which continues to record until the tape runs out. So basically, he's filming what he's seeing very deep inside the catacombs. Other than the point of view shots, or pictures of human bones. The catacombs for centuries. So it is possible with these paintings uh, that we may be able to retrace the itinerary to some extent. We hear his breathing get louder and louder. Uh, as though something was scaring him. He was, he's, he's frightened, he's frightened. Occasionally he stops, perhaps, to try to decide which way to run among all the many different corridors. He's running faster and faster and faster, deeper and deeper into the catacombs. And all of a sudden... The man is never seen again, and his fate remains unknown. The Paris catacombs are a haunting gallery of the past. Their intricate maze-like structures hold secrets that to this day have yet to be uncovered. Hundreds of kilometers of centuries old tunnels lay just beneath the bustling streets of the metropolis above. With no clear map of these tunnels and exploration strictly prohibited by local officials, many of the secrets of these catacombs go unanswered. Even worse, those who get lost in its twisting corridors are sometimes never seen again. While the roughly 2.1 million Parisians go about their daily lives, three times that amount are buried in the catacombs beneath them, along with whatever else could be lurking there. But how did this even happen? Let's go back to the very beginning. Paris would acquire the name we know it as today in 305 AD, Civitas Parisorium in Latin, or City of Parisian French. But 253 years prior, Paris would go by a different name, Lutetia. In the year 52 AD, the Roman Empire conquered the town of Lutetia and effectively turned it into a garrison town for their armies. To provide resources for the empire, they built the first of many open-air limestone quarries. Lutetian limestone, commonly referred to as Paris stone, was a high-quality stone extensively used in various construction projects, including significant monuments and buildings in Paris from antiquity through the early 20th century. The extensive use of limestone from these quarries contributed considerably to the architectural development of Paris, with limestone being used for many iconic structures like parts of the Louvre and the Arc de Triomphe. In the year 508, after the collapse of the Roman Empire, Paris would be conquered by Clovis I, the King of the Franks, and Paris would become the capital of his empire a few years later. Paris would become the largest European city during the Middle Ages. As the city expanded over the centuries, so too did the need for resources to build it. Open-air quarrying became difficult and costly when what they needed lay below Paris's surface. By the 15th century, only a few open-air quarries remained, as miners would go below ground to extract their desired resources. These underground quarries were dangerous from the very beginning, as miners had to provide a way to maintain the enormous weight of the city dirt, rocks, and city above. 
One way of maintaining the underground quarries was a method known as pillars tournées, or rotated pillars in English, where an initial tunnel would be dug horizontally along the mineral deposit, as well as secondary tunnels perpendicular to the first that were opened along its path. Tunnels parallel to the first tunnel would be opened through these, creating a grid of columns of untouched mineral deposits, which would explain the labyrinthian design of the catacombs today. The safety precautions the miners took were not enough, and tunnel collapses, including from the city above, were common. One major collapse in December 1774 resulted in a large section of street in Paris plummeting to a depth of 30 meters. Two years later, on September 15, 1776, an official decree by King Louis XVI closed all the quarries underneath the city of Paris, bringing the problem of tunnel collapses to an end. But this history lesson doesn't explain the most pressing question. How did we get from underground limestone quarries to the construction of the world's largest mass grave? Running a city is an eternal game of whack-a-mole. You solve one problem, but other problems pop up. But in this case, a problem of the past became a solution for the future. In the 18th century, overcrowded cemeteries endangered the health of Parisian citizens. The most notable of these was the Cemetery of the Innocents, which became so overcrowded that corpses were stacked on top of each other to compensate for lack of space. To make matters worse, the cemetery was situated in a busy neighborhood near the Leal's Market. This proximity led to significant disruption of the market's activities, with the putrid stench of rotting corpses and the unsanitary conditions becoming a vector for the outbreak of disease. By 1765, Paris Parliament would restrict burials within urban neighborhoods and churches. And 15 years later, a decree from King Louis XVI would close these cemeteries. But closing the cemeteries alone would not stop this public health crisis, nor did it provide a solution to the problem of lack of space to house Paris's dead. French archaeologist and Paris police Lieutenant General Alexandre Lenoir proposed a solution. Repurpose portions of the abandoned 300 kilometers of underground limestone quarries into mass graves. This is the event that would lead to the creation of the Paris Catacombs, and a 1.7 kilometer section of the massive tunnel system was repurposed to house the corpses of Paris's overflowing cemeteries. The skeletal remains of over 6 million people were rehoused. By 1809, the Paris Catacombs were opened by public appointment, given the nickname Catacombs in reference to the ancient Roman catacombs. The catacombs would go on to leave a mark on French culture, with French writer Victor Hugo referencing these tunnels in his novel Les Miserables in 1862. The subsoil of Paris, if the eye could penetrate its surface, would present the aspect of a colossal madrepore. A sponge has no more partitions and ducts than the mound of earth for a circuit of six leagues round about, on which rests the great and ancient city, not to mention its catacombs which are a separate cellar, not to mention the inextricable trellis work of gas pipes, without reckoning the vast tubular system for the distribution of fresh water, which ends in the pillar fountains. The sewers alone form a tremendous shadowy network under the two banks, a labyrinth which has its slope for its guiding thread. There appears, in the humid midst, the rat, which seems the product to which Paris has given birth. The catacombs also found another use besides limestone and body storage, mushrooms. As it turns out, Paris mushrooms thrive in the cold, dark, damp environment of the catacombs more than the forests in which they originate. In Victor Paquette's 1847 book, Trait de la Culture des Champignons, he attributed this discovery to a Parisian farmer who in 1811 discarded a disappointing mushroom harvest into an abandoned limestone quarry only to discover that the mushrooms he had discarded were thriving. This was in contrast to the failed attempts throughout the 18th century to cultivate mushrooms in traditional growing environments, which would often result in infected or unusable crop. 
The farmer's discovery caught on, and by 1880, more than 300 mushroom farmers worked in the underground quarries, producing 1,000 tons of mushrooms each year. Of the products which originated from the depths of the catacombs, mushrooms were perhaps the better of many products to be made there for sale at market. Or at least according to this excerpt from Scientific American, published on October 30th, 1852. When the cemetery of the innocents at Paris was removed to the outside of the barriers, the buried corpses which had accumulated to the depth of 60 feet were found to a great extent apparently converted into fat. The substance of the skin, cellular tissue, and tendons, all the soft parts, and even the bones, had completely disappeared, leaving only the fat which, resisting longest the influence of decay, remained in the form of margeric acid. This human fat was employed to the extent of many tons by the soap boilers and tallow chandlers of Paris for the manufacture of soap and candles. The French are a people of fine sentiment, and they certainly carried the quality to a charming point of reflection in receiving light from candles made out of the bodies of their fathers. We loathe the cannibal, but civilization has features which, if not rendered familiar, would be as repulsive as the practices of the savage. The catacombs have also played a role in modern history. During the Second World War, the Germans used these tunnels for military purposes during their occupation of France from 1940 until Paris was liberated on August 25, 1944. Constructing underground bunkers connected to the vast tunnel networks of the catacombs. The most famous of these was a bunker built under Lichy Montagne, a French secondary school. The French resistance would also utilize the catacombs, turning them into a base of operation to plan attacks against the German occupiers. This included French medical student René Sattel, who in 1943, while studying in Sainte Anne, Paris's oldest psychiatric hospital, explored an old air raid shelter in the basement. His curiosity peaked when he discovered an old lock gate in the wall and picked the lock revealing an entrance to the tunnels of the catacombs beneath. René spent the next year doing nightly explorations of the southern network of catacomb tunnels, mapping them out as he went and effectively creating the first in-depth mapping system of these tunnels. These nightly explorations led to some surprising discoveries, including the discovery of the location of German bunkers. René's intention of mapping the tunnel system from the beginning was to aid the French resistance and he sent his completed map to Roll Tanguy, leader of the French resistance. However, it was only in early 1944 that Roll Tanguy would receive this map, and this achievement in cartography, while under the constraints of German occupation, would ultimately go unused. In more recent history, the catacombs have been the site of raves throughout the 1990s. Is throwing a party in a vast labyrinth of unlit tunnels reckless? Of course it was, but at least the party goers weren't there alone. The deadly consequences of that company would be felt by two teenagers almost three decades later. Since 1955, it has been illegal to enter the Paris catacombs without permission, with the only public section of it being available through guided tours. However, that doesn't stop catacomb enthusiasts, otherwise known as cataphiles, from thinking that it's easier to ask for forgiveness rather than permission. This was the case for two friends, aged 16 and 17, who decided to have a night of daring and adventure. On a Saturday night in June 2017, the two boys embarked on a journey into the unknown and entered a restricted part of the catacombs. They barely made it out alive. While not a lot of information is known about the boys, most likely due to French privacy laws, one thing is certain. They were terrified when they discovered that they were hopelessly lost in the catacombs. Trapped in never-ending tunnels surrounded by darkness, there was no end in sight for these two young men. As the hours turned into days, one could only hope that they prepared themselves for an overnight adventure. But knowing their age, this is unlikely. The boys were trapped in the Paris catacombs with no way to escape. And unless they were prepared for the chance of this going wrong without food or water. It's not clear when exactly the alarm was raised about these missing boys, 
But three days after their disappearance, an investigation was opened by the French police. As their luck would have it, they would be found and taken to the hospital to be treated for hypothermia. Their discovery was credited to tracker dogs deployed by French firefighters following a four hour long search and rescue mission. After examination in the hospital, both of the boys were fine and suffered no injuries. They made it out alive, which can't be said for everyone who has become lost in the abyss that are the catacombs of Paris. Hi, thanks for watching. Starting a new channel, especially one in a genre people aren't accustomed to me making content in, has truly left me scared awake. I've never undertaken a project like this before, and I've remade this entire video from scratch more times than I care to admit while refining my skills as a video editor and a storyteller. A huge shout out to my viewers on YouTube and my supporters on Patreon. Support the channel today by becoming a subscriber at patreon.com slash scaredawake and join our Discord where we discuss horror, mysteries, and the true stories that are stranger than fiction. As well, a special thanks to Hainsworth who made the Scared Awake intro, Jazzdog for producing several original songs for this channel, Camel Spider for making multiple animations that were used throughout this video, and Arif Hassan for the help with script editing. Let me know in the comments what topics you'd like to see covered on this channel in the future. And remember, stay awake.